It must be really nice to be in an outlook, world economic outlook, where you look at the rest of the world and you look at the Asia broadly, APAC region, is the brighter spot this year. Absolutely. Uh, we have Asia growing at 4.6% this year. It's a revision of 0.3 percentage points compared to our October World Economic Outlook. And that's largely driven by what's happening to emerging markets in Asia, led by China, where we revised our growth forecast from 4.4% in October to 5.2% in, in 2023. So that's the big change uh, in the numbers here. And what's the change in the fundamentals? The fundamentals, the thing is, in, uh, in China, what we've seen is, you know, we had uh, when we, it, an uncharacteristic slowdown uh, earlier. Now we have China rebounding much faster than it anticipated. So both mobility and consumption are projected to grow faster than we had expected in October of uh, last year. And that's fundamentally uh, different to what we had before. But what is also uh, true is that the external headwinds from slowing growth in the U.S. and Europe continue to weigh on prospects for Asia. So where both U.S. and Europe uh, account for 20% of uh, Asia's exports, they are slowing. Mm -hmm. So that's an offset. But China is compensating for that, so, but higher growth. Krishna, we saw in the first 10 days of South Korea's trade numbers extremely, extremely weak when it comes to external demand. So what does that tell you about the risks to the region, particularly if you overlay the risks coming from increased geopolitical tensions between the US and China? Sure. Again, one has to put things in perspective. Uh, external demand is weak coming from US uh, and Europe for Asia. That's being offset by what's happening in China. But going beyond that, there are these rising uh, uh, geofragmentation risks, which uh, for Asia can mean a lot, because Asia is one region which is highly integrated, benefited a lot from globalization. And if these fragmentation risks arise, that could be a significant problem for Asia down the road. What about debt? Because clearly in the rate environment that we've been looking at for emerging markets, one of the biggest issues has been debt resurfacing. And then you roll in China as well. Do you see risks in that sphere? Sure. See, if you look at uh, the debt in Asia, Asia's share of debt has risen from 25% uh, pre-pandemic to 38%, right? And that share, that debt reflects both an increase in public debt and also debt of households and non-financial corporates. So to the extent that interest rates remain high, that can have a significant bearing on prospects for uh, countries in Asia. I want to ask you about the banking crisis, right? It started in the U.S., it spread to Europe. Uh, when, the, when the World Economic Outlook broadly released today, that is the, the downside risk. Uh, uh, Felipe Medaglia, who is the governor of the Central Bank of the Philippines, was on with us just yesterday. And when we were talking afterwards, he said, you know, he's, the reason that Asian central banks are not con uh, concerned in that regard is because of all the lessons they learned in the 97, 98 financial crisis. Do you agree with that view, that that isn't the same kind of risk broadly in the Asian region, or do you think there are still financial stability risks there too? So again, uh, if you look at the financial turmoil in Europe and uh, in the U.S., the impact of that on Asia has been limited. And that's part, that largely reflects the fact that policymakers in both Europe and U.S. took a very aggressive response towards the uh, turmoil, and that kind of limited uh, negative sentiment of markets. Now, if you go beyond that, if you look at what Asian countries have done since the Asian financial crisis, there's been an improvement in both macroeconomic fundamentals and institutional frameworks. If you look at uh, the exchange rates are much more flexible. They have monetary policy frameworks which are much more modern. Many of them are inflation targeting frameworks. Their external accounts are much more uh, robust, large uh, reserves. So in, in many ways, the macro fundamentals and institutional frameworks are bet better than what we had uh, during the Asian financial crisis. That said, one has to be... Um, you know, one has to be careful. One has to be humble in saying the fact that risks can arise anywhere. And so one has to be monitoring these risks carefully, both in terms of interest rate risks, exchange risks, and so on. So one has to monitor that carefully and address that uh, if it arises. Well, look at India. You know, it's a, a very big player, powerful economy in the Asian region. And you've revised your outlook for them. What do you see now? What's this based on? So we revised our uh, projection for India very marginally, from 6.1% to 5.9%. And that largely reflects a slowdown in consumption growth, what we used to call as revenge consumption. That is subsiding. So, but that said, investment continues to be pretty good. And uh, services exports from India are booming. 
notwithstanding the fact that growth in the U.S. and Europe is slowing. So that again tells you that Asia is still, uh, sorry, India is still a relative bright spot in the global uh, landscape. Sticky inflation, aggressive so central bank rate hikes. This is all but universal now. Uh, how does that? How big of a risk? It seems that emerging markets, Asian nations, many of them are in a better position than many developed countries. So again, when we look at inflation, we have to look at the fact that headline inflation is moderating in Asia. However, core inflation is still very much sticky. And there are forces at play which could make this sticky. And what are those forces? One is we see output gap in many countries that have either closed or are closing. And, the, and number two, uh, exchange rate pass-through uh, is still a factor at play. And what we have found in our analysis is when inflation is high, pass-through is also that much higher. So we can, we can see that core inflation could be sticky, and that implies that uh, central banks still have to guard against uh, uh, you know, inflation, uh, uh, runaway inflation. So it, it's important for central banks to address he inflation head-on. You, you mentioned the uh, case of the Philippines, right? Philippines is one country where they have raised interest rates very aggressively by 425 basis points. That's not the case for other uh, countries in the region where interest rates have been more modest. Krishna, when you take a look at the short and the medium term risks around the region, what are you focusing on the most? Is it sort of demographic challenges for the likes of China? Is it uh, fragmentation geopolitically? Or are you looking more at shorter term risks like a credit event given what we've seen in the US and Europe? So again, uh, both, there are both short-term risks and uh, medium to long-term risks. In the short term, the risks, of course, come from external factors for Asia, further slowing of Europe and uh, US, which account for a large part of Asia's exports. Going beyond the near term, there are significant medium-term risks. One, of course, is China, where we revise our medium-term growth forecast to below 4%. And there, again, it's a question of productivity, it's a question of aging population, uh, and that's, that's one. The other is, of course, uh, geofragmentation risks. I mean, the fragmentation risks have risen quite sharply over the last five years and have been accentuated by the war in Ukraine. If those risks rise, then Asia risks to lose the most among all the regions in the world.